a happy Sunday morning to you. I'm glad to see the sun is out and it's not cold today. So praise the Lord. Um, this morning, thank you so much for being here. Um, a few quarters ago, in our Sabbath school lesson, it was all about finances and how to manage money. And our Sabbath school class decided it would be a good idea to have someone who knows what this means for us in our future to come and talk to us and educate us on all these things. So we reached out to the SMEC, Southern New England Conference, and the pastor helped us, and we were di directed to <coughs> Sister Audrey Falkenberg. And she's here this morning, grateful that you're here, sis, to help us better understand what these terms mean and how we can better plan for our future. So thank you very much for coming. Seeing that as we listen, that we will certainly make changes in our lives so that we can relax, knowing that you have led us thus far and you will take us all the way. Thanks again for being with us. Thanks for being our God who cares. And be with us now, we pray. In your name, dear Jesus, amen. Thank you, Nadine. And I am really honored to be here. This has been in the works for quite some time, coordinating different schedules, mine and yours. And it's, it's just taken a, taken a bit of correspondence. And Nadine, thank you for your persistence. And I can tell that she is engaged on your behalf at this church. So, and I'm sure all of you all are. So I'm Audrey Falkenberg, and I'm the Southern New England Conference's Plan Giving and Trust Services, as well as Stewardship Department Director. And I have with me April Montoya Gonzalez, and she is my assistant. And we also have one other member, I'll show you a picture of her, that is our accounting person. So we are a team here to serve you. I'm especially honored to have April here today because her family recently grew from three to four. She just got back from maternity leave. So I, 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 I was actually surprised that she could pull a Sunday away and because uh, we will leave here directly after this meeting to go to an executive committee to, to report there. So today's a full day for us, but I'm honored to be here and I'm thankful that April is here. Do you get the idea that we're all about grateful living? Yes, do you see it? And because we have a, a compact space, I actually have one more banner, but I thought it might be overkill. So, and I appreciate your fine team working with me to set some of this up. I was telling um, them that when I purchased my my displays here, my direct report, which is your conference treasurer who is watching the pennies, he said to me, Audrey, and he was looking at the cost, and I said, no, I will use this every church I go to. And he said, I hear that all the time. So <laughs> your, fine, your fine members here, Nadine and her team, they helped me set things up so that we can use it. And I hope that when you leave this place, that you remember that it's all about grateful living. And grateful living isn't just about what we do at the present. It's about what we do with what we have. Yesterday, I was able to share at the Cape Verdean church. It was actually a, a, a meeting of all the Cape Verdeans together. And there were over a thousand people packed in a church. And I honed in on Matthew 25 when I shared with them. If you haven't read it recently, I want to invite you not to just read it, but to immerse yourself in it. And I can guarantee you that every time you read Matthew 25, you're going to come with come away with a different a different message that Jesus is trying to give you, that the Holy Word is trying to give you. And in Matthew 25, we have three great parables. Does anybody know right off the bat what one, two, or three of them might be? Ten talents. There you go. Pardon? That's close, but not quite. So you have the parable of the ten virgins. They all had a vessel, right? But five of them were prepared. Five of them weren't. We all have a vessel. If you're living, breathing, you are a living vessel. So I want to commend you for being here because you are engaging and preparing 
with what you have for the bridegroom that will someday, I can't wait, but take us all home. The second parable in Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. This isn't about whether you're rich or poor. This is about saying, what can I do with what I have to honor my creator? If we go back to Genesis, we were made in whose image? God's image. And then God assigned us all with a task. What is that? We, we are all assigned with the task to have dominion to be stewards of what he has given us, whether it's five talents, ten talents, or one talents. And maybe you hear the, the term estate planning. You know what? I'll never have an estate until I get there. But actually, I do have an estate. I have things. I have a car. I have some, some antiques that were given me. You have an estate. Don't ever think that what you have is not worth accounting for because you have been gifted with everything that you have and it belongs to God. So as we think about estate planning, we can think about, number one, our vessels. We can think about our talents, what we have and what we're doing with it. And then the final, the final parable is that story, that parable Jesus told about the sheep and the goats. That parable is all about what do I do with what I have to bless others? Now, I am from the Southern New England Conference. I am paid by the Southern New England Conference. I work in the stewardship and the plan giving and trust services department. So my goal is to invite members to be all that God wants them to be, and God created us to give. What is, what is the, the highlight, the mecca, the, that verse that just we all know, John 3, 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him, you know the rest, gave God gave we were made in God's image so we were created not only to care for what he has given us but to also give so as your plans giving and trust services director the conference's stewardship director whether you like it or not I know that you will be happiest when you are giving and the best thing to give to is God's missional purposes. That starts with your family. That starts with you. I am not here to say, give everything you have to the church. That is not what I'm here to say. But I am here to say that giving will allow you to be complete. In fact, there are studies that show that people that give are happier. There's an, an actual endorphin kick, an oxytocin surge when we give. Maybe that's why parents love to give good things to their kids. It's not because we want to take care of our kids. It's because it feels so good to give. Anyway, so we have those three parables. But then right after that, there's Matthew 26. And that starts out with a woman. Matthew doesn't give her a name. But this woman came to Jesus and had some expensive, expensive perfume in a bottle. And this woman, without a name in the Matthew narrative, pours that on the head of Jesus. And what did the onlookers say? What a waste. What a waste. But then Jesus said, everywhere the gospel is told, the story of this woman will be remembered. So I would invite you, as you consider your giving plans, to be wasteful for God's purposes. You take care of yourself. That's what God wants you to do. 
You take care of your family. That's what God wants you to do. You engage in his missional purposes. That's what God wants you to do. And there's God of timing, when to give, what to give, to who to give. That's why you're here. Because it's very complicated. I am still learning the vocabulary. I was just talking with April today on the way here. You know, all these different different avenues for giving seem quite complicated. But actually, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. What we are here to do today is to introduce you to some broad general terms and information so that you can begin to process and assimilate. And the Southern New England Conference is here to help you with that. And I will say right up front that we provide financial support for individuals that work with us to make a gift to God's mission. It doesn't have to be necessarily to the Southern New England Conference. Maybe you have another ministry that you want to help support. But first of all, I want you to know that I am your advocate. I had a lady, one of our great members. Um, I just love her. I will not tell you her name, and I will not give you details because we respect the confidentiality of every individual, and I want you to know that right now, that if you work with our team, whatever you share will be held in utmost confidence. This lady... She was selling her home, and she says, I want to give everything to the church. God will take care of me. I trust him. Little is much when God is in it. I don't need anything. I'll give everything. And I said, you know, do you have family that we can bring in to this conversation? Well, yes, I have a daughter. Well, she brought her daughter into it, and her daughter and I convinced her that it was not a wise move to put all the proceeds from her home into a charitable gift annuity. With a charitable gift annuity, we'll talk about that. You put money into a charitable gift annuity, and there is funds generated annually for the rest of your life. She's, and I said, with what you will put into a charitable gift annuity, it's not enough to live on. It's just supplement. God will take care of me. I don't need much. I convinced her not to give everything to the church because she needed to make good decisions to take care of herself so she wouldn't be a burden to her family and she wouldn't live under this cloud of stress. I need 20 more dollars to get groceries. Where is that coming from? So let's go to the next slide. And um, this is your plan giving and trust services team. You've met Audrey. You've met April. And this is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is about this big, maybe smaller, but she is sharp, and she is there to serve us. She keeps track of things, and it's great to have her on our team. We are here to serve you, and we are all about God's missional purposes. We are not attorneys. We are not attorneys. We are not tax specialists. We are not financial gurus. So we will give you information so that you can make educated decisions. This lady that I was talking about, looking at her situation, I said, I think you need to see an elder care lawyer. And so she did. She went to a lawyer who specialized in elderly people that are going from one stage to the next and they need to be taken care of. And she will always be a generous steward of whatever God has given her, her time, her talents, her treasures. But she has also gotten some expert advice on how to manage her funds. If something were to happen to you and you have children or other people involved in your life that are estranged with the church, and they wanted something, but they see you gave it to the church. And they said, well, Audrey Falkenberg spoke with you. Audrey Falkenberg gave you financial advice. Audrey Falkenberg helped you write your will, blah, blah, blah. Then they will have every reason to not trust the church. So because 
we care for you and we care for your family. We disconnect ourselves when it comes to the final decisions you make. We will give you information and then you will be led to process that information according to how the Holy Spirit impresses you. How the Holy Spirit impresses you. I believe that Mary, who wasted everything on Jesus, according to the onlookers, was guided by the Holy Spirit. In my life, I have had people say, Audrey, what are you doing? We lived in Asia. We, lived in, we were missionaries in China a total of 18 years. And there was an ev a time when I almost lost my daughter because of the pollution in the city where we lived. My kids were sick all the time. And that's another story for another time. But after we almost lost her, people came to Bob and me and they said, what are you doing? Why are you staying overseas? Why are you utilizing your talents in that way and not in another way? You almost lost your daughter. Well, guided by the Holy Spirit, we chose to continue to serve in that area. So I want to invite you, as you go through the process of gathering information, to have Holy Spirit guiding you and impressing you. It might not make sense to other people, but you will make decisions that God can smile on as you follow the Holy Spirit's guidance. So when we, let's go to the next one. Thank you. When you look at estate planning, we have to remember that God owns it all. Would you agree? Okay. And that we are responsible. We've already talked about this. We are stewards for what God gave us. And that the motivation for what we do is love. This all sounds like God and Jesus, doesn't it? They, they feel responsible for us. They love us. They own us. They are caring for us. And then people. Remember people. Now, you can't see this whole sign here, this whole banner, but remember people at home. That is people in your own home, your own family. You want to remember people at home in your home church, in your neighborhood, and it goes down to across the country, around the world. And that is the beautiful thing about the Seventh day Adventist Church. We are engaged constantly in the Gospel Commission to tell the message of love around the world. When you put your tithe on Adventist giving, you are engaging in the world mission. Now, most of our tithe in this conference stays in this conference to support gospel work, but it trickles down and trickles all around the world. You are a part of a church that is completely, wholeheartedly interested in you and the Great Gospel Commission to reach the world. Faithful, biblical principles with stewardship. God owns it all. We must be responsible with what is in our hands. We are motivated by love to serve people faithfully. Let's remember those key points. Now, if we go to another slide, and we're getting into the nitty-gritty. So I want to have one more prayer before we move on so that God will open our minds and our hearts to what we hear so that we will handle what he has given us wisely. Let's pray one more time. Father God, it is such an honor to be here today. And... Um, I'm just a, a servant for your mission, just like everybody else in this room is. Because of that, Lord, I want to dedicate the rest of our time together to you so that we will make wise decisions honoring you in the eyes of our church, our family, our friends, but mostly in your eyes so that you someday will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. So when we think of giving, we have current gifts and legacy gifts. Estate planning isn't all about 
what you do at the end, what you have allocated for after you pass on. It starts today. And though legacy giving, making a plan for what's left over at the end of your time is important, gift planning, legacy planning also means how we engage today in giving. So that is our current gifts. And you need to not give it all away. You need to not put all of it into some account that you just are benefited somewhat from. You need to not give it all to the church because you do have a responsibility to take care of your housing. You cannot live in this country, the United States, without your own form of transportation by and large. I lived in Hong Kong for a total of 14 years of my life and for all but three, we owned no car. That's because I didn't need to have a car. I did have to have money for transportation, though. Buses, minibuses, subways, ferries, you name it. Utilities. You need to cover your utilities and also health care. These are things to keep in mind. And as we go through this today, the main purpose of today's meeting between us is to connect us so we can give you information and guide you as you move along, but also to help you process gathering the information so that you and your lawyer and advisors can make wise decisions. Is that fair? Is that good? Okay. So we all have, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> He's tracking with me back there. We all have estate goals. Why are you interested right now in planning your estate? What I will say is one of the most important thing is you will provide peace for your family. My mother-in-law is a saint. I mean, my mother, and my mother-in-law too, but my mother is a saint. She does not want to hurt anybody. So she can hardly stand to, in her will, identify who gets what because she doesn't want to hurt anybody. Guess what? There are four girls in my family. I'm one of them. And I'm saying, Mommy, if you don't identify it, you will cause more problems <laughs> for us when you go. I know the dynamics of my family. By you making decisions now, you will provide peace. They, they might not be happy, but you will make your wishes known so that you will minimize the conflict. I talked with another individual, and this person said, I don't even want to see my parents' will. Because if I see it, then I'll have to say I saw it, and then my sister might say, wait a minute, you saw that, so what did you do? What did you say? Anyway, let's be, be very careful. So we want to provide peace for our family. You want to reduce probate costs. Do you all know what probate is? Yes. Okay, let me ask a question. Is there anybody in this room that has a will right now? No, okay. Don't worry. Don't feel badly. You're right in line with the rest of the U.S. population. <laughs> but what I wanted to do, I wanted at least one of you to raise your hand so I could give you a prize. So let me think of another question. You have an outdated will. Guess what? Your will stands unless you update it. So I will award you with a special gift for having at least done a will at some point. <laughs> These are very nice gifts. So if you all have a will, you don't have to give them all. They're just going to be like a few gifts left. So let's see. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the Your will will guide the system. The judge will say, oh, he wrote down what he wants. So, oh, he wants this person to be in charge. Oh, okay. The, and the, the state will oversee how things are carried out. 
but you, because of what you stated in your will, have a say-so. That is probate. So you reduce the cost. Let's say, just for simple simplicity, you leave $100, and you haven't made a will. It will take more time in courts and processing so that that $100 might only be $40 that your two children split between the two of them, okay? If you had had a will, 100% minus a small amount would have gone to your kids. If you do not have a will, what percent will the state decide can go to charity? Zero. So if you don't have it stated somewhere and probate the process will not allow one penny to go to the local closet that you donated to that helped single moms that didn't have financial means get clothes. It wouldn't go to your church. It wouldn't go to amazing facts. It wouldn't go to it is written. By the way, no, I love amazing facts and it is written, but they are also here providing services. And so God invites you to give where, where you want to give. And you can work with us for other ministries as well. So if, pardon? Sure. We'll, we'll get to that later. That's a great question, but. An outdated will would be, um, my husband passes away, and, and, and somewhere in the, or, 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 let me give another example. I have left something to a good friend of mine in my will. 20 years later, we are not friends anymore. I don't even keep track of her. And I don't even know where she lives, and I don't know. So I would want to update my will. So a will, a probate court might look at a will and say, whoa, this was made 20 years ago. Uh, we basically need to start from scratch because none of these people are still living. These addresses are wrong. You've been married and divorced two times since you made that will. You know, this type of thing. But, but if you have signed something to somebody, like a payable upon death, if you have a bank account and you write that somebody will be receiving that money, and that was 20 years ago, and that person is no longer in your life, it will go to that person. Anyway, so how does something get outdated? Um, the truth is, is you should be updating it every three to five years or when a significant event happens, and we'll get to that more later. And that is one reason the conference is here to serve you, is we want to keep abreast of your, your file so that we are writing you and saying, hey, this is Audrey in April. Is there anything that's happened in your life, any of these events that maybe we need to update your will? Also, your will will change. The will for a single mom with two kids is going to be different than when she is many years, when she's 60 years old and remarried uh, uh, married a millionaire. It's going to be different, right? Different ages, different stages. Pardon? <laughs> Do not marry him because he's a millionaire. <laughs> okay, well then. I kind of like guys. <laughs> I you're you're very picky. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm no comment, right? <laughs> okay, so this is why we want to have estate goals. But how can we have estate goals unless we identify, define what our state is. And what happens if you don't? Once again, if you don't make a will, then the state decides what happens. Seven out of 10 people in the United States pass away without a will. And um, your conference knows that it's helpful to you. And when it's helpful to you, it can make a difference for God's mission in your life and your engagement in God's mission. So that's why we are here to serve you. So there's a planning process. And um, there are wills and there are trusts. Do you know the difference? 
Okay, let's hear. A will is a document where you specify where you want your goods to go and it gets probated. If you have a trust, it's a different document that can live on beyond your death and it will dictate how you want things to go in perpetuity if you wish and it avoids probate. Very good. You, you get a prize. <laughs> So it is true, I, a will basically says what I will pass on when I die, based on what I've said. And like you said, a trust puts what I have somewhere else so somebody else can be in charge and it can go on in perpetuity or end according to my wishes, so. That is a good point. A will is probated, which means it's public records. Anybody can look at your will and see. Now, just because you don't see it in the will doesn't mean it wasn't there because there are a good number of things that you pass on outside of a will. Don't try to memorize all these details, but know as you go through the process of gathering information, these all these things will be, content, be, be considered. So, the first section, when you start gathering information, has to do with your family, okay? And it's important what you document. It'll be your legal names, birth dates, address, phone, email address. If you make a move, that should be recorded. So if, if you, Audrey sends out a Christmas letter and it goes to address A and it is forwarded to you at address B, you're gonna say, ooh, I should let I should let Audrey know that I've moved so that they can update my records that they're keeping at the office. So it's important to gather family information. That is the first thing. Now, depending on the situation, you may not want to remember. We recently, okay, when I was over in Asia, one of my responsibilities was working with Adventist Mission and planting churches across China. And we were able to raise funds here in the States, and it was a huge, huge blessing. But a gentleman that was a good friend of ours, now that we've moved back to the United States, he made a huge donation to God's mission here in the Southern New England Conference to the tune of several millions, okay? And we said to him, what about your kids? You need to remember your kids. But the millions he gave us are just in addition to the millions he has. Anyway, yeah. But he said, he said, you want to make, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> His English, eh, you know. <laughs> no, but he said, I don't need to leave anything to my kids. They are way better off than me. So there are times, depending on the scenario, where you do or don't want to leave to your kids. But it would be good in his will to write, I leave to Xiaoming one dollar. That way the will or the trust states very clearly that he was considering that child. And so, anyway, you want to have great information about your family. So as you gather information, that will be, you'll be prompted to do that. And when you distribute, there are three places that everything you have will go. It will go to loved ones, it will go to charity, or it will, it will go to the government. Now, I don't want to be disrespectful to my government, but <laughs> when you make decisions in advance, I, I think probably you all just don't love writing those tax checks, right? And probably you don't want to think that's happening when, when your time is gone. So you can make decisions in advance. You don't want to leave your gifts to something other than that is meaningful to you. Planning allows you to make that decision, those decisions. So there are many different estate options. There are, and this can get complicated. And April, I'm going to ask you to pass this out.
I'm not going to show you. I don't, I don't want you to look at this now, okay? But April passed it out. Take this home. This has all sorts of different areas that you might, ways that you can give. Um, for example, charitable gift annuity, charitable remainder trust, charitable remainder unit trust. This is not meant to confuse you. This is meant to allow you to begin to read and understand and let the information start to seep in. And you will notice that some place it says, um, and this is, this is put out by the Southern New England Conference, but we work with a company called Crescendo who helps us with our material. They're used across the nation. They are excellent when it comes to financial advice. So it will say, give to us or our. That's talking about the Southern New England Conference. I want you to know that I'm not trying to be pushy or coercive at all. But when it says us or our, it's stated on our behalf. But you can, you can give to any charity. It doesn't have to be the Southern New England Conference. It can be other, other charities of your, of your favorite sort. But read this. It's good information. It will also help you identify that some of the things are passed on outside of the will, that they don't go in a trust and they don't go in a will. But this is all something that you'll learn more about later. And in fact, I met with one lawyer, and he said, Audrey, I just want to meet with the people and just talk to them. Because all of this paperwork, all of this information can be overwhelming. That is why I want to invite you to relax, enjoy, get the address, put the phone number in, and just slowly go through things. And you can either do it online. I prefer online when I do things because I can't read my handwriting if I don't do it online. But you can also, we will be giving you a booklet in April. We'll talk more about that with you. But there are different options for estate plans. It's more simple, more complex. And a lot of it has to do with taxes and tax breaks. For example, with an IRA. If you have an IRA and you, let's say you have $10 and $10. If you want to give $10 to charity and $10 to your kids, make sure you give the $10 uh, from, uh, for charity from your IRA because they, you will pay no taxes on that. Whereas if you give your kids $10 from your IRA, they will have to pay taxes. So these are different things to keep in mind. And as you read through this brochure and other information, you'll understand a little bit more about it. So you have your estate options. Now, when it comes to signing a will, you can go online and click make a will. You can do it for $39.99 on the internet. I want to encourage you not to do that. Every state has different laws. You're not going to have fresh perspectives, somebody you dialogue with. And there are requirements. There are many times when wills are made that if they're not done properly, they're null and void. So when you make a will, or anybody does, the person needs to be of a legal age. They need to have full capacity. That doesn't mean if I'm having senior moments, that doesn't mean I can't make a will. It just means that I need to make a will when I'm not having <laughs> senior <laughs> moments. <laughs> yeah, okay? And then you need to have an intent. When you write a will and you create it, you're not just doing it to just to write stuff down, just to make account for what you have. You have an intent to do something with what you have. You have to have an intent. And when you do a will, like recently we signed a will with a member of our conference. They came into the conference office. A lawyer that they chose came into the conference office, and there were witnesses there. So it is done completely legal and above board. And I think that is something to remember as well. 
often there must be a proper signing ceremony. People will write their will and print it out and put it in their kitchen drawer. That does not cut it, okay? So let's, just to protect yourself, remember to, there is a right way to do it. There's no right way to do a wrong thing, but there is a wrong way to do a right thing. My parents told me that when I was younger. <laughs> Audrey, there's no right way to do a wrong thing. You had a question? I'm not going to speak to that because it depends on who is notarizing it and it depends on the timing and the dating. And there are some things you can add to a will, like you've written things out and you're like, oh, man, I just got that car. And so you write down that you want the car to, or you, but I'm not going to speak to that. But I do know that there are things that might be notarized that are not necessarily fulfilled according to your wishes. Do you have a question? I was just going to ask if there was a difference in those two about how they were created and how they were removed from the probate court. Yes. Go to your probate court. Wherever, you, wherever you're living, you can talk to them. But I would say that if you allow the conference to partner with you in this journey, then there will be some financial support we will make sure we only recommend that you work with lawyers. Just the, the language, the language could be picked apart. And a notary is not there to tell you that everything is written up properly. They're simply to say that they saw you sign it or whatever. So good question, but I, um, I, would, I would be remiss to say no problem with that one. So let's go. When you have a bequest... A bequest is when you leave something. When you have a bequest, you preserve lifetime flexibility. For example, if you want to leave some a gift and it's in your will, you can go in and change it. Because you make a will or you make a trust, it doesn't mean you're locked in for life. That is why they get outdated because they're no longer applicable or relevant. So don't be afraid to do something today because you don't know what it's going to be like in three years. You can always go in and update things. You can change your mind. And different gifts have different tax rules that will benefit you. And so that is also something that you want to consider. And that is variable uh, as well on your, on your age and what your total assets are. So the whole tax thing is, is something that you will want to get advice on. But if you haven't gathered all the information, then any of the advice you get may not make total sense. Yes? Well, in this situation, the individual that we are working with did not have their own lawyer. So what we do is recommend a lawyer or two or three that we have confidence in. And it's up to you to choose that lawyer. This is not a lawyer that works for us because we don't want to have undue influence or conflict of interest. This is a lawyer that you choose. And in this situation, the individuals felt uncomfortable I've, I've gone with a lawyer to a client's home, and we've done all the legal work there. I have also brought the clients to the office, and the lawyer comes to the office because it's a um, proximity. It's a good location. Did you want to say something? Oh, okay. You had something? I have several lawyers in this conference that are Adventist, but... One of them is very, very pricey, and so though we will help subsidize, you will choose the lawyer you want. I have one couple that chose the very, very pricey lawyer. That's fine. It's up to them. I have other couples that have chosen a non avenous lawyer that the conference has worked with for a long time. We don't have a lot of estate planning lawyers in this conference. And in Connecticut, the clients that we have served 
that are here in in Connecticut, we have invited them to go to a, a non-Adventist lawyer that everybody's been very, very, very happy with. So I, in fact, one of the Adventist lawyers in Massachusetts, he says, you know, it's kind of funny. He says, maybe an Adventist lawyer isn't the best because they might have a bias towards leaving money for the church. And of course he would not. But if you're somebody that's, I, I appreciate wanting an Adventist lawyer. I like Adventist doctors. I looked for an Adventist dentist when we got here, you know. But you can get excellent care and legal guidance from non-Adventists. And one thing we will do, if you say, hey, I've got a lawyer down the street. I, I've passed his, ho his office for years. You can give me his name, and I can do research, make sure he's, a so he's registered with the bar, um, I called one lawyer for a client, and he was advertised as doing estate planning, and then I asked him how many he's done in the last five years, and I recommended to my member, I wouldn't go to him, but it's up to you. So we're just here to, to journey, like I said, with you and, and help you make your own decisions. And if, if I think you're going, like, woo, way off, like this one woman that wanted to give everything to the church, I will tell you, I, I said, I, I cannot do that for you because it's, I don't think it's, you're not taking care of yourself like you should. All right, good question here. Let's go on. Any, any, other, any other questions out there? Nope. I've, I've got one more gift. Since we're talking about family and kids and giving, who has the most grandkids in this room? How many do you have? Oh, well, who can top that? But you already got a gift. I know. I got eight grandkids and two great-grandkids. Okay, anybody have more than two great-grandkids? <laughs> okay, let's see. I hope you... Okay, what the second most? Okay, we have ten grandkids, you said. Who has the next number of grandkids? You have six? Six? Oh, you guys are... Okay, who's got the oldest grandkid of the two of you? What, how old is your oldest? Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes. I can just tell you I have several options in Connecticut that our members have been very, very, very happy with. I think part of it, too, though, is if you choose to go and process things on your own, what I would still invite you to do is to go through the data collection prior to. Because if you go to a lawyer on your own or even with the conference saying, we're supporting you with this, subsidizing the cost some lawyers pay charge by the hour and so the more gather more information you've gathered ahead of time the better so I will tell you that the cost for um, estate planning lawyers up here is very, very high compared to other places. So, yeah. Okay, once again, the conference does not require that you leave something for the church, but as you respect that we are being good stewards of our time at the conference, we invite you to remember God's mission, okay? So that, but it's not a requirement. 
But when it's all said and done, when we have some documentation that is all done and we receive an invoice, then what we have been doing, now my treasurer might say, Audrey, you can't do this anymore, but at this point, what we are doing is for a trust, we will subsidize for a single person $500. And that's a good chunk of change. Or for a will. $500 for a single individual and $750 for a couple. It's our ministry to you because we know that we're inviting you to take care of your family, to make plans, to do an inventory of what you have. And so does that answer your question? Hmm, I've had two, two lawyers, one with a very, very pricey one, and as I recall, I think that one was per, you were filing some of this maybe, maybe not yet. It was several thousand, for plus for, for a trust with one lawyer, for another lawyer it was just at a thousand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Let's talk. You know, when this is all said and done, you'll have my number and we can talk. So, yeah. Well, I will tell you the $40 online is that your conference will not give you $500 for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but depending on the nature of your will, and I am, do you have kids? Praise the Lord you are here. Kudos to you because you are thinking what most young parents don't want to consider, that something might happen to them. So I think um, if, if, you, if the conference, I cannot make promises what the total mm -hmm. cost would be, but if we are subsidizing for a will at $500, you might, that's for a couple, for a couple, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're a couple. Okay. 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 Then you might not be too. You might. I would. I would suggest that you you avoid the online thing. Okay. Um, but it's your decision. All we're doing, April and I, we're giving you information, and you will make educated decisions. So let's go to an IRA. Um, I think we we're not quite in sync. It says bequest of IRA. Go the next slide, next slide, next slide, n the next slide. Oh, maybe we've been off for a while. Okay, voila, there we are. Okay, bequest of the IRA. That is another thing. If you have an IRA, we we touched on it. I won't go into it in great detail, but you will. There are better ways to bequeath that IRA than than others. Yes. independent retirement account and depending on the company you work for you might have been able to put money away in an IRA probably if you if you yeah if you bought one you you know what it is yeah yeah, a, a traditional IRA has excellent benefits, but you can't draw from it until the, according to the latest, is at 59 and a half, and then and or or less your tax less on it if you start withdrawing at 70 and a half. But I will tell you, laws change all the time, all the time. Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, those are the three states in our conference. Every state has different laws. And by the way, if you go to, I know you're not going to do this, but if you were to go online and do it, how do you know that you're dealing with the most up-to-date? That's one thing I don't like about the web. Sometimes it's hard to tell what date you're looking at. Okay, so an IRA that goes directly into charity is your best break as far as tax goes. Um, let's go to our next slide. And... Um, will with a trust for minors so um, if you have a will 
and you have minors and something happens to you, you might want to also have a trust that what you have left in your will, once you pass on, will be overseen by the trust. If I have $1,000 and my kid is six years old and something happens to me, I want that money to go into a trust where April Montoya is going to be the trustee and I'm gonna have it clearly delineated how she will use that money to help my child. Now, when my child turns 22, then, then he will get what's left, just cash out right. Or I might say at 22, he's on his own, I've paid for his college, his high school, I want the rest of it to go to the Southern New England Conference for Evangelism. Anyway, that's what you can do with the will and a trust for minors, or just the will. I heard a tragic story of a, a woman who had fostered a child and fell in love and it worked out that she could adopt the child, but she never got to her paperwork. And so when she passed on an untimely death, then other people came and took care of that child in a totally unchristian environment. She had been paying for that child to go to Adventist schools and come to church every week if she had signed the proper documents. So that's a great reason for single parents. So if you have people in your life that are young, tell them it's never too early. 18 or older, you can make a will. So when it comes to your property, when you do an assessment of your property, it, depending on how your property is titled, it can be passed on in different ways. Do you have a will or a living trust? Once again, we've talked about two different things. What about estate planning? How are you looking at it to reduce your taxes? What about charitable gifts leaving a legacy? There are people in our conference that put a chunk of change into a charitable gift annuity, and so every quarter, they get a certain amount. And we are obligated to pay them out that annuity on a regular basis. Even if they outlive what they gave, we are obligated. But then if, when they pass on, they can designate exactly where that gift goes. Yes. Does the church have protection? Well, we work with, with BNY Mellon or WAF with our annuities, and there is protection. In other words, what I've been told, if we run out of money, we will sell the president's desk to fulfill our obligation to, to our, our members. So I've never heard of a case where it doesn't work. As far as the fine print on our arrangements with BNY or with WAF or wherever a church member might choose to have their annuity. They go through us, but we are, then we have the back office, the big wigs that we're working with to make sure things go okay. Yes, yes. April, in your experience here, have you known of anything other than that? Um, no, so I've only, you know, annuities are funded by our assets. So what we said, we pay the president's desk, and then there's a chunk left that we have to take out. Yeah. I can't speak for what Amazing Facts uses, but if it's a charitable gift annuity, it has to be done. That is all um, government run, even the rates and everything. So they tell us what the, what the interests are and everything. So by nature, an annuity is overseen by something much larger than us with the rates and everything and the payouts. So, yes? BNY Mellon is, is, a, is a huge bank. And WAF is, stands for Western Adventist Foundation. It's what many, many Adventist members and ministries 
are utilizing to with their estate plan and to oversee and their investments. And we have been starting to work with WAF and keeping it in the church, but a very, very reputable company. But at this point, what you will do is gather information. And I want to underscore, I want to tell one story then show you a video. Um, when I was living in China, the most densely populated territory, more people in the 1040 window that are unreached than any other place in the world. In fact, there's one city, a municipality called Chongqing, which you've never heard of, but the population of Chongqing is greater than all of Canada. And so you can imagine the rush, the, the, the excitement of identifying unreached areas of China and raising funds so that workers could go into that area and share the gospel. We had 70 plus cities with a population of over a million that we had identified without a, an Adventist presence. So when I came to the Southern New England Conference, and they asked me to serve in this capacity as planned giving and trust service director, stewardship. I said, oh, I have to be honest with you. Oh, I wanted to be involved in ministry, frontline ministry, you know. But friends, this is ministry. It is stewardship is an umbrella that affects every aspect of your life and I am privileged to work with April and Elizabeth in inviting you to remember God's mission as you take care of your family so here I am thinking oh man I was actually in school and I wanted to go full-time to school I came into the office and my good assistant and friend here April she says Audrey did you get some money from us at one point over there? Very large sum. And I said, well, no. I said, any money that would have come to the Chinese Union for church planting, entering unentered areas, would have come through me. I know. I watched every penny and made sure it was used for exactly what the donor had intended it to be. I know. I know we sent some money over there. Well... She pulled out a file, found it, and there was a little sticky note that said, thank you. This money has been used to support hundreds, I'm not quoting it just right, hundreds of church planning teams in China. Lois. It clicked. Lois was a treasurer of gospel outreach a supporting ministry out in Washington State. Somebody from this conference had sent a huge amount of money to gospel outreach, restricted and designated specifically for church planning in China. So there I was over in China doing God's mission with funds that came from this conference. So when April brought this to light and we discovered that this conference had been invited, involved in God's Mission China, I'm so honored to be here and provide a service for a part of the world that is blessing God's mission in China. It's just so exciting. And there are these kind of stories everywhere we go that he can use ministry. So as you go through the information, something you will want to identify is guardian for minors if you have young children at home. You also identify an executor, a personal representative. And this is the person that when you do your will, that when something happens to you, they will oversee making sure your wishes are carried out. They are the ones that will be working with your probate, with the probate, with the courts, to make sure things are done according to your wishes. And then, of course, if you make trust, you will 
oh, this slide got out of, out of order here. But there, this is just another information I meant to not show today because it's, you've heard of TMI? Mm. Yeah, well, the, the Adventist Church has decided it's total member involvement. But I, I say TMI, it's just too much information. So don't worry about this right now. We'll get to this another time. When you are doing your will, part of the package is that you will have a health care power of attorney. You know what that is? A health care power attorney is that person that will make sure that your wishes are taken care of when you are momentarily incapacitated. Let's say something happens and you're in the hospital or whatever. You have a health care power of attorney. This is good to have designated. Be, um, there's a story of also a situation where a family member needed to make a decision and they did not want to allow it, but she said, look, I'm the, I am the health care power of attorney. So it's good to have that identified. Um, you know what a living will is, right? In the process of making your will, we invite you, and most lawyers will include that, is that you have your health care power of attorney and that you also make a living will as well. And that way you can, you can identify what your wishes are so that people will know that. Um, so when we plan, we will protect and we will provide. You've gotten introduced to a lot of information, but I wanna invite you just to take it one step at a time. Whether you do it online or whether you start filling in the blanks. How many of you all were able to write down your, um, your name and your contact information on the paper that went around? Is there anybody that did not? We, we, you have that that you can turn in, but there's also this clipboard. And I want you to know, I will contact you and you will say, thank you very much, Audrey. I, I, I can't deal with this right now, but I hope you will say, how can you help me? This is what I need. And we can move forward from there. But I will, my commitment to you is that if you've written your name down, I will be contacting you, seeing how I can serve you. And if you have any more questions at this point, how I can help you with gathering information. And then at whatever point we get there, connecting you with an attorney that you choose that you feel will serve your purposes. Also, I want to, when I contact you, I'll be asking you if you want to receive an email newsletter that comes from a nationwide company called Crescendo. And it will just send you nuggets from time to time about decisions that you need to make, encouraging you, reminding you, and it's just really, really good stuff. So grateful living. We were not made ladies and gentlemen, to deal with this. We were not made to deal with what will happen when I'm, I'm gone. But it's a reality of the life we live. And as we engage in making informed decisions, we can hasten the day when we don't have to deal with this anymore. So at this time, I'm going to have April come up and share a little bit of information about gathering the data and the online tool we have. And if you're, if you're okay with online stuff, but you would like a little help, I have helped people, April has, get online and start filling out their information. Like I said, for me, the beauty of online anything is that I can read it when it's all done. And we work with a secure site. Your information is protected. So April, why don't you come on up? Um, what you can do is he'll be taking your cues. Yeah, that's where we are at this picture right here. Good morning, everyone. I'm April, for those that don't know me, there are a few people that do. Um, so I'm gonna take you through getting to our website. So we've gone over a lot of information, and man, are you gonna remember every detail? This is 
it's hard stuff. So um, here's a website, snecklegacy.org, and where do you begin? My husband and I had a baby three years ago. I did not have a will at the time. All of my assets, I didn't have a house. I didn't have you know, expensive cars or jewelry or all these things. So I had never done a will. But then um, my retirement account, does everyone know what a, a beneficiary, beneficiary designation is? Have, have people heard of that? I've heard of that. So um, a will does not accomplish, does not transfer assets that you would by beneficiary designation. What that means is our retirement accounts, a lot of our bank accounts, you would never place that in your will because it wouldn't matter. What if you guys have been in the workforce, you would normally fill out with your work, I want my husband to receive this upon my passing. That's what a beneficiary designation is if it's a new term to you. So I had done that. Before that, I wasn't even married, so I had filled out my beneficiary designations. I listed my parents, my sister. I didn't need a will. But then I got married. So we learned from Audrey, in life events, we're supposed to be doing a will. And we had a baby. Now it was really important for us to start working on a will. Because we wanted to make sure if something happened to us, and we had our daughter right at the height of COVID. Right when we had our daughter, maybe two weeks later, the world just shut down. So here I am, a new mom. And I said, what am I going to do? It became very real that I'm having this little girl. And what if something, what if we get this? So we got on a will right away. So we started here, actually. And uh, we went to the conference website. And there is a section called Plan Your Will. I kind of have a little arrow on that. And if you could go to the next slide, I'm going to take you through what my husband and I did. So on the next slide. You're basically going to start creating an account. You can see that little button that says create an account. Do you guys see that? What our website does is take this and take you step by step. So it's very overwhelming to think of all the things you need to plan on. But this is going to give you just one segment at a time. OK, you can go to the next slide. Once you're there, you're going to just put in your email address. Very easy so far. Go to the next slide. And then you can see I put in some of my information, my email, first name, um, last name, so forth, and I hit submit. That created my account. And here, now I want to start my will with my husband. So I went ahead and clicked that. And this is where it's really helpful, because it's going to just take it in small pieces and packages. We're going to talk first about, oh, can you go back just one moment? We're going to first just going to gather some basic information about me and my family. Then we're going to go into my contacts, my health care. Who do I want to be my executor, which is the person that will make sure whatever I've listed in my will is going to be carried out with the wishes that I have wanted. And then we're going to go over finances. Do I own anything? Well, at the time, that wasn't a big piece for me. But if you have a home, again, the assets that you you know have, this is where you're going to put it down, as well as your debt, because that's really important as well um, as your executor would need to pay off debts, as well as distribute your assets to um, family, charities, and so forth. And then the last section. So as you see, it, I, I didn't take a screenshot of everything, but you can see how this is going to guide you through the entire process from start, the very beginning of first name, to what do I own. I didn't think about it, but yeah, I do have those stocks that I, I haven't touched in forever. It's going to help you gather all that information. For my husband and I, we probably spent a few hours which we didn't need to. It was actually on the discussion of guardians because he and I had a completely different idea of who we'd want to raise our daughter if something happened to us. 
And that took a long time, so I'm talking to the mamas here that you would, you'd be surprised as you have these conversations. Have you had, I mean, I see young mom, have you even had that conversation ever with your husband? Who would raise our children if something happened to us? Have you had that? For us, we hadn't yet, and it took us quite a while. But at the end of the day, we said we want to pick people. I, want, I just said, Brian, I just want to see my little girl in heaven. And I said, your family's very nice, but they're not going to bring my girl to church. So they're going to my sister. <laughs> and so at the end, he agreed. He said, yeah, you're right. You're right. We're going we're to get her to the, to the right place. I hope we never need that document. You know, I want to raise my own baby. And we just had another one. Now we have a little girl and a little boy. But the peace of mind I have knowing that my kids are OK my retirement account is already marked. So it, I told you, a life event, right? A life event, you always change your plans. Beforehand, my parents and my sister were my beneficiaries. As soon as I got married, I really need to make sure that I change that to make sure my husband is now taken care of. Now I need to make sure that those assets are named properly, that my kids are going to be taken care of. So every life event, I'm updating my will, if I have a trust, which I don't, but if, if I had a trust, I'm making sure that's, and your accounts for your beneficiary designations with work, for your retirement, your bank accounts, all those are updated. So when you get through the process online, if you could go to the next slide, this is what it generates here. You can see how when you bring this to an attorney, Everything is down there for them. And this is what Audrey was trying to explain earlier. You really want to have a lot of this information already gathered ahead of time. And it could be a savings to you, whether you use our attorney or someone else. You've already done a lot of the work. They're looking at this with you, and they really have an overall, uh, overall idea of what you need. Because you may not, do you need a trust? Maybe, maybe not. So this is helping them um, in that determination. Um, do we have one more slide on that, or is that the, okay, that's the last one, okay. But um, that just shows you the finished product. This is kind of the equivalent of what you have in that guidebook. So if you prefer to do it just handwriting, you can do that. That's what this is. If you feel comfortable on a computer, you can do this. I did this over the phone with someone, and she felt comfortable sharing that information. So I literally just said, we just did one by one. And it took us two appointments, um, and we went through. And um, now she has a will, actually, because in the end, she worked with Audrey. I worked with her in the beginning, and Audrey then took over and, and um, went to the attorney. So. so I hope you guys, do you have any questions just on getting onto our website, on making an account, or I know Audrey's going to come back up, just questions overall as we've been presenting information to you? I think it really just depends on your circumstance. So uh, for me, a trust would probably be more important because I, it needs, I can't give an asset to a minor, right? So it's not that I, I don't have a lot of money, but my circumstance, I may need a trust for my, for my child to, to manage those funds. However, I think as a general rule, typically with more assets, there is a trust. So some people may just be able to have a will. And then beneficiary designations like my 401k or IRA, that's going to pass outside of a will. So some people can just use a will and their beneficiary designations. And then for someone mentioned a special needs trust, as different needs come up, then you may need a trust. But an attorney would be the best person to tell you. Um, if you if you need one of those. Usually when you have more assets, you a trust becomes uh, an important tool for you to use. But there might be circumstances where it just makes sense for you. Well, 
No. More than likely, a will will be fine. Um, it's usually with larger assets or special s circumstances that you would need a uh, trust. But if you have um, fewer assets, um, then that should cover you. Most people, you know, just a regular trust, uh, excuse me, a will would be sufficient. But then as you're working with an attorney, if there's any of these things like the special needs or minors or, oh, I have a property here, you know, then you may get into the conversation of the trust. But more than likely, a will would be sufficient. But they would be the best person. You would always would consult our, um, an attorney to determine what you need in your estate plan. Typically, no, you'll have both. You should always have a will. Oh, you always have a will. And then, in addition, would be a trust, where everything would pour. You can have a will that pours over into a trust. One thing I have heard is always a tipping point. If you have property in more than one state, you should have a trust. That's a tipping point. But if I live in a mansion, bank account, your insurance policy, your cards, you can just have it that it, it goes directly to another person when you pass on. So it's very, you know, just totally underscore what April is saying is it depends. Mm -hmm. It depends on your age, your stage, um, what you have. Like you might not have a lot of money, but you might have a precious teacup that you want to make sure your granddaughter that doesn't need to go in a trust, that can go in a will. But um, depending on, it's not necessarily all about value when you add up the dollar amount. But in general, I would say yes. You know, when you have people, as we have more and more money, life gets more and more complicated, so you might want to have a trust.
just allows April to see it and say, hey, look, it's been three weeks. Let's, let's do the next one. And then the last one is create PDF for printing. That means you can print it out and save it to your lawyer. Well, I can get a PDF and email it to your lawyer because I've made it the lawyer that you choose is somebody that's a friend of mine. Or I've worked at the conference and I say, hey, attorney John. I'm going to tell you one last story. Oh, one question. Okay. So my mistake is half of my problem. If something happens to you, yes, they, they will well, have. If you don't, if you don't so name a guardian.
walking away saying, no problem, one step at a time, Audrey and April can help. Why? Because our conference is inviting us to serve you so that you can make informed decisions to take care of yourself, your family, your church, the community, ministries that you love. It's a part of being a good steward, which is over our Abram LaRue. Abram LaRue lived in the 1800s. He was a very, very wealthy man. He was a mariner, went port to port. He got a message that everything had burned. And he, uh, he lost everything. And he turned his back on society, on God, on family. And he ended up living in the mountains in Northern California as a shepherd, just checked out, living off the grid. But he had a neighbor that was a good steward with the knowledge she had of the love of Christ. So his good steward neighbor shared Jesus with him, shared the Seventh-day Adventist message with him. He became an Adventist. And he said, what can I do with who I am, who God has made me to be, my experiences, to bless God's mission? He decided that he wanted to be a missionary to China. Okay? And um, so he called the general conference, and he said, I want to go to China to be a missionary. There's Christianity is hardly there. Adventism, we don't have Adventists. And he had spent a lot of time in the ports around the world, and one of his favorite places was Hong Kong. Well, the General Conference said to him, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists said to him, you're too old. He was in his 60s. They said, you're too old. But you can kind of head out you know, to the islands in Hawaii or that area if you want. Well, not that he needed their permission, but he did get a crate of books went to Hawaii, started selling those books, Christian books, with the beautiful messages that we have as an Adventist church. And in a, several years, he called the California Conference, and he said, you guys need to come here. I've been selling books. I've been giving Bible studies. There's a church that needs to be formed here in Hawaii. So send some of the brethren over. Let's get the church started, because I am going to China. So he got another box of books and got on another boat, and he went to China. He spent 14, 16 years sharing the gospel on the wharfs, on the piers in Hong Kong Harbor. And um, wanted to reach the Chinese. But he was really connecting with more of the sailors that came through or the expats that lived there. And when he passed, after all those years, he had uh, just, there were just a few Adventists. He wrote to the General Conference. He said, you need to send more people here. We need young people that can learn the language and go up into the mainland of China. Abram LaRue died, and he's buried on a hillside in Hong Kong. And he's buried in Happy Valley Cemetery. That's the name of the cemetery. When Bob and I lived, in Hong Kong, often we would walk out of our apartment, and we lived in La Rue building, by the way. We would walk out of our apartment, catch the elevator, go down, walk the driveway down to the road. We could catch bus number six, or 63, or 66, or mini bus 15, or take a taxi, or walk. 
down the hill, get off the bus, and go into the top entrance of Happy Valley Cemetery. And when we were discouraged, or we were inviting people to realize God's power when one person commits, we would go to Abram LaRue's grave, which is right there on the side of the hill in Happy Valley Cemetery. And I know that when the Lord comes, there are a lot of people I want to I want to see first or second or third. But Abram LaRue is right there. Because when he wakes up, I would love to be the first one to tell him. When I was in China, there were over half a million Seventh-day Adventists in China because of you. Because of what you did wasn't with his money, but it was with his time, his talent, his interest. And he poured it into God's mission. Tom Dabrowski is going to meet whoever invested in him. He has no idea who that person is. Abel Maru is going to meet a lot of people that are in heaven because he broke the mold and went to serve in China. So what is God asking you and me to do with what he has given us? It's a personal decision. And I want to invite you to, as you plan and prepare and you go through the steps, pre be prayerful about it. Your situation is different than the person next to you. It's different than mine. Your kids, your family dynamics, what you have, it's different. But be prayerful. What you have is God's. And whether it's present day or legacy giving, he will guide you and he will reward you for what you're doing for him. Um, before you go, as you go, feel free to come up. I've got some information here. This is some information, general information on tithing and being a good steward, what that means. I've left with Nadine that she might use later um, in this church. But here's some, an IRA stocks. More and more people are, are making gifts to the church with stocks. Um, this is about charitable gift annuities. When you have a large chunk of change that you want to give to charity, but you want something coming back from it through the years. And here is 